Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we're going to pick up where we left off with Danny and cover her first three chapters in A Dance with Dragons to see if we can find anything that might indicate Danny will turn into a homicidal maniac, destined to burn women and children by the thousands for absolutely no reason and justify her actions by claiming that she was freeing them. So, let's do this. Danny's first chapter in A Dance with Dragons and 22nd overall, begins with an ominous and foreboding overtone, which definitely sets the appropriate mood for her Dance with Dragons storyline. It begins with Danny being woken in the dead of night to learn that one of her unsullied, stalwart shield, has been brutally and savagely murdered by the Sons of the Harpy. This was the first time that the Sons were bold enough to kill one of her unsullied, but it most certainly would not be the last. After ordering Grey Worm to make preparations for her fallen soldier's burial, she pleads with him to figure out who these cowards are, so that they might learn what it means to wake the dragon. Unfortunately for her, the Unsullied are singularly ill-suited for the task. This is important, because in the Marinese web of lies, deceptions, and secrets, Danny stands alone, because, while her supporters might be staunchly loyal, none of them are adept at playing the Game of Thrones. She then follows Brown Ben Plum's advice and dons her floppy ears, otherwise known as a tokar, because if you want to be the queen of the rabbits, you have to look the part. This is sort of the Marinese version of what Aegon I did when he created a coat of arms for House Targaryen because he wanted his people to view him as one of them. So, having barely gotten any sleep, Danny, now garb as a bona fide lady of old Gis, holds court, something that she's done every day since taking the city. This is where we meet the Lickspittle Resnack and the honest but brutal Skahas, two native Marinese noblemen that she's taken into her service as advisors. When they voice their opinions on what should be done to deal with the Sons of the Harpy, Resnak favors basically doing nothing and just increasing the reward for information, while Skaha suggests killing one nobleman from each family in Marine, two the time after that, and he was pretty confident that there wouldn't be a third. Not wanting to continue to use violence as a means of power, she rejects the notion put forth by Skaha's and agrees to increase the reward to 1,000 golden honors. Danny then thinks to herself that the only way that she can truly rule Marine is to win the people over. And as she holds court, it becomes clear, based on the way that she doles out justice, that this is her goal. As the day progresses, we see Danny deal with a wide array of issues, from both former slaves and former masters alike. And as a quick aside, in addition to taking Miranese advisors to assist her in holding court and making important decisions, she also made a concerted effort to hold court in accordance with local customs and decrees. This is another parallel between Danny and her legendary ancestor Aegon I, who traveled the realm with maesters, who advised him on local customs so he might hold court wherever he was in accordance with their traditions. We aren't going to go into every single petitioner who came to court in Danny's first chapter, but the overall message was that she is trying to be a fair and just ruler. This is evident in her rulings, which were not perfect, but made it clear that she was trying to be objective when making judgments. She wasn't playing favorites. She ruled against former slaves and former masters alike. Hizdahar Zolorak then makes his first appearance, which was apparently the sixth time he came to her court to plead with her radiance to reopen the fighting pits. She cuts him off before he even started. 
then gave him a verbatim play-by-play of his case, which apparently convinced him, but she denies him nonetheless. Some of the petitions were regarding former slavers demanding recompense for things that happened during the sack. But Danny wisely offered a blanket pardon for all offenses that occurred prior to her taking control of the city, which, as hard and harsh as it sounds, was unquestionably the right decision. Otherwise, every slave that rose up would be at risk for being charged with crimes associated with them rising up which was illegal when they did it, and Danny's laws weren't enacted until after she settled things down, and ex post facto enforcement of any law is sketchy to say the least. Some of the other petitioners seemed to serve more of an expository purpose, such as Lord Gale, who came as an envoy from Astapor for Cleos, the Butcher King. He came bearing a gift of gilded leather slippers, and to inform her that Cleos intends to make a move on Yunkai. Danny tells Gale that Cleos would be wise to tend to his own gardens, while also thinking that she sort of regrets leaving Yunkai untouched, for they had immediately reinstalled slavery and were raising levies against her. In spite of this crossing her mind, she does still reject the offer to stand with Astapor against Yunkai remembering the promise that she made them if they complied with her demands, which they did. Several petitioners were seeking recompense for livestock they claim were devoured by her dragons, and while she doubts the legitimacy of some of their claims, because she was receiving more daily claims on livestock than her dragons were capable of eating, she honors their claims nonetheless. Even that didn't seem to please them. Having noted the discrepancy between the volume of claims and the amount that her dragons were actually capable of eating, she does, however, wisely rule that henceforth, those who come seeking redress for lost livestock must first go to the Temple of the Graces and swear to the gods of Gis that their claims are legitimate before attending court. As the court emptied out, Danny sees a man clutching a cloth sack. When she summons him forward, he spills the contents on the floor which turned out to be the bones of a child, whom he claims was killed by Drogon. Danny's second chapter begins almost exactly like her first one. She's awoken in the middle of the night and told that the Sons of the Harpies Shadow War continues. This time, they kicked it up a notch and killed nine of her followers during the night, which is the most deadly night they've experienced thus far. Six were unsullied, two of which were poisoned at a wine shop they frequented. When Danny learned of this, she ordered Skahas to question the owner of the shop and his daughter, who were in custody. He asked if she wanted him to do it sharply or sweetly, and she told him to do it sweetly to begin. Then, they told her that a woman she freed in Yung Kai that was a harpist of surpassing skill and had been a leader amongst the Yunkish freedmen and represented her people as an advisor to Danny, was among the dead, and that they had mutilated her body. Danny was sick and tired of this BS, and her fire became a fury in her belly. She turned to Skahas and told him that she changed her mind, and wanted him to question the wine cellar however he saw fit. I'd wager that many of you have an issue with Danny's decision here. But interestingly, George elected to place an author's annotation on that exact sentence that states, Daenerys has exhibited a fiery temper on occasion, which seems appropriate for the mother of dragons. In other words, Danny has a temper, but based on the way the annotation is phrased, it doesn't appear that George thinks it's a problem, and to be honest, to get the people of the city to cooperate with her, she needs to strike a little fear in their hearts. Trying to be nice in the hopes that they'll like her certainly isn't working. They just view it as a weakness, and are getting bolder and bolder the longer she lets it play out the way it is. She then decided that her unsullied would no longer be used to keep the peace in Marine. They were all ordered back to the Great Pyramid to see to her safety. The Miranese people would have to see to their own safety. So Danny orders Skahas to create a new city watch, 
comprised of equal parts freedmen and shavepates, that came to be known as the Brazen Beasts. When Resnak asks where the money will come from to pay this new city watch, Daenerys decides she will exact a blood tax on the noble houses, and take two children from each as well, a boy and a girl, that will serve at court. Upon returning to her chambers, she hears Missandei crying, as one of the slain unsullied was her brother, so she comforts her until she falls asleep. She then makes her way onto the terrace to think. When trying to figure out how to fight this shadow war, she has the following thought. She was the blood of the dragon. She could kill the sons of the harpy. And the sons of the sons, and the sons of the sons of the sons. But a dragon could not feed a hungry child, nor help a dying woman's pain. And who would ever dare to love a dragon? Danny's thoughts here are significant for two reasons. The first is that while she clearly understands that she could pretty easily kill her enemies in Marine, and that might settle things down for the short term, it won't actually solve all of her problems. Her people are starving, and there's nothing that using her dragons can do that will help that. The real issue is that Marine offers nothing of value to the rest of the world if they don't sell slaves. Their land is pretty much useless for producing food. And the only natural resource that they have that is semi-valuable is copper, which isn't really all that valuable anymore because steel has replaced bronze. It seems likely that most of the food that sustains them is brought in by the ships who come there to sell marine food and use their profits to buy slaves. So without slaves to sell, those ships aren't showing up anymore. After all, there are plenty of other places ships could go where they can sell their goods and immediately fill their ship back up with goods that they want. When you first read this storyline, most of us probably assume that the lack of trade that Marine's suffering from is largely due to backlash Danny's getting from abolishing slavery. And while that might play some small role, the fact that they have nothing to sell appears to be the more significant factor. This has essentially turned the extremely difficult situation that Danny's facing into a nearly impossible one. The second big takeaway here is that this is the first time that we see Danny have something resembling negative thoughts towards her dragons and her association with them. She even wonders who would dare to love a dragon, and it doesn't seem like she's applying that just to her children. She's applying it to herself, which is made even more apparent when she starts thinking about Dario, whom she was dreaming of just before she was awoken. She even asked Barristan if perhaps Dario had abandoned her because he found another woman. This seems to tie into who could ever love a dragon. I know that this seems minor, but it speaks to the fact that despite being the mother of dragons, queen of marine, and the most beautiful woman in the world, she's still pretty humble. Then she decides a bath will help soothe her. But no sooner had she gotten in and begun to relax, than Quaith appears. She once again begins by pointing out that everyone is sleeping, just like she did when she paid Danny a visit in the middle of the night on Balerion, and goes on to give Danny yet another litany of cryptic warnings. She tells her the glass candles are burning, and that soon comes the pale mare, kraken and dark flame. Lion and Griffin, the Sun's Son and the Mummer's Dragon, and that she's to trust none of them. She tells her to remember the Undying and beware the perfumed Seneschal. As seems to always be the case with Quaith, some of what she said was probably good advice, but the fact that her message was once again nearly indecipherable, Danny is left nearly paralyzed with more questions than answers. This makes her increasingly paranoid of those around her, and reticent to trust anyone. The next morning, when she holds court, she finds herself looking askance at her advisors, mindful of the three treasons the Undying warned her about. She's able to turn her mind away from that dangerous path, though, 
by telling herself that prophecies are treacherous, and carries on with her day, exhausted for lack of sleep. Among the petitioners was Hizdahar, there for a seventh time, to attempt to convince her to reopen the fighting pits. But this time was different. Danny notes that he wasn't wearing a tokar, and that he had cut and trimmed both his hair and beard, which is eerie, considering the fact that she literally thought to herself how much better he'd look without his silly hair the last time he came, which took place in her first chapter. And here he is, looking exactly the way Danny thought he'd look best. This time was also unique due to the fact that he did not come alone, but rather with seven friends, pit fighters, who were there to plead with her to reopen the pits. They essentially tell her that if they are free, why not free to fight? She didn't really have an answer to that, and tells them she will think on what they said. After court, while chatting with Barristan, she's struck with a sudden urge to go see her children, who we learn she had bound and chained beneath the pyramid after the father came to court with allegations that Drogon had killed his daughter. We learn that Viserion and Rhaegal had been taken, but Drogon, not so much. As Danny beats herself up for locking up her children, she recalls how she and her council had decided to deal with the man and his dead child. There were some who urged her to put the man to death, so that he may never tell anyone what happened. But Danny could not bring herself to condemn the man to death for political expediency. Instead, she told him to never speak of what happened to anyone. Ever. Gave him a hundred times the gold she gave everyone else, and told him to come back every year on her name day for more, so that him and the rest of his family would never want for anything. As she reflects on all that has happened, and wonders if her children were monsters, she then thinks to herself that if they are monsters, so was she. The entirety of Danny's third chapter in A Dance with Dragons centers around Zarozoan Doxos's visit to Maureen, the offer that he makes her, and what she decides to do with it. The chapter begins with Danny offering Zaro the hospitality of Maureen. And after the follies had ended, the two of them speak. He essentially tells her that she has enemies all around her, and that Karth was ready to join them, but he convinced the leaders of Karth to give him a chance to solve this without bloodshed. He's there to offer her 13 ships that she can use to leave Marine and go to Westeros. After asking him for some time to inspect the ships that he's offering, Danny summons her council to discuss her options. They're pretty simple. She can take the ships and wash her hands of Slaver's Bay and the enemies that she's made trying to make it a better place for all people, which will almost certainly mean that Marine will go right back to being what it was before she got there, and the people that she freed and those who supported her would be back in chains or dead. Or she could stay and finish what she started. Danny once again shows herself to be that one in a million person who takes the road that almost no one else would go down. Most people would jump at any opportunity to get the hell out of this shithole. She has almost no friends here and is surrounded by enemies. She's practically a prisoner in her own home because there's a huge bounty on her head. Half of the known world is on the verge of declaring war on her, and she's ruling a city that without slavery has nothing to offer, which is actually something that Zaro reiterates to her during this chapter, when she asks him if he could get Karth to trade with her. There is nothing in Marine for Danny, but trouble that she doesn't need. But she decides to stay anyways. Not for herself, but for the people that she started this fight for. When she tells Zaro that she cannot accept his offer, his reaction pretty much reinforces what I just said. He was completely shocked, as if he had never met someone in his entire life that would say no to such an offer, which is most likely true, 
because there probably aren't more than four or five people in the entire world that George created that would say no to this offer. But Danny is one of them. <laughs>